So, hello everybody. So here we are beginning the uh, Ecop Wednesday uh, with uh, Ricardo Serrao Santos. He's a senior scientist at the Azores University based uh, in Orta. And uh, so he's a, a really complex person with a full career. So I will uh, begin uh, with uh, the position uh, in Orta. He's a marine ecologist uh, for like more than 20 years now. <laughs> And uh, he has a few uh, politician uh, positions uh, in the past. So he was a member of the European Parliament for five years. And he was also a former um, Portuguese minister, minister of the sea. So he has a lot of experience uh, merging uh, marine science and policy. So it's a really good uh, good uh, guest we have here to talk about uh, marine science and policy. He will talk about uh, the, um, the anachronism between the science and the policymaking uh, uh, related to the ocean and how he, he began to, uh, to go to politics uh, with his, his uh, scientific background and uh, how the perception and the consideration of the ocean um, evolved in uh, in the society. So, Ricardo, uh, if you want to add something or correct me uh, about some uh, mistakes I could have made, please introduce yourself and you, you can begin your talk. And for the slide sharing, so I will uh, pass the slides. Uh, I will not... Uh, be in your mind. So just tell me uh, when you want me to, to go to the next slide. Uh, um, I'm sorry, just before I, I, I start, the, the, the slide does not... Ah, oh, right, now it's okay. Thank you very much. I so made a thank Zoom. you very much uh, <laughs> for this introduction. Uh, I don't find myself a very complex person, but I touch several uh, fields and... Uh, and I forgot to say that, in fact, I, there was a time I was uh, vice chair of the European Marine Board, who uh, I want to acknowledge and thank for organizing also this, uh, this meeting. We failed the first time, but it is for me a great pleasure to be, to be here. And um, my aim in this talk is to tell you a story of a meme uh, that lasted uh, uh, at least for 400 years. And in fact, it has been constituting a cultural anachronism. Uh, my idea is that we have been living in terms of conception of the ocean in still in the 16th century. Uh, the 16th century and only recently we gave a leap, an epistemological leap. So, I'll start by situating myself, and uh, you can begin on the second slide. Uh, in my life, I've been involved uh, in science and politics, more specifically, as I told you, in ocean science and ocean politics. Uh, for five, but for 25 years, I've been emerged in several aspects of fundamental and ocean politics. Uh, sorry, in ocean, um, fundamental and applied ocean science. As you said, in politics, I worked as a member of the European Parliament from 2014 to 2019 in a co-legislative uh, contest and later as a minister of the sea here in Portugal in executive context. My times in politics, particularly in the European Parliament, open a set of cracks in assumptions that I had taken for granted in the context of the ocean. I realized then that for more than 25 years in science, I had lived encapsulated in a world of peers who share the same scientific paradigms and the same cultural perceptions. The scientific paradigm, the critic was the, that we understand the critical relevance of the ocean 
to the stability and the resilience of life on planet Earth. And this was so unquestionable and based on sound science that I assume all lay people share this same perception. In this understanding, I thought that it could be obvious that policies and politics aimed at a disturbed ocean were unquestionable for the safety of our societies and mother hearts. I should have realized then that the obvious is a virtuous error, a trapless, a trapped carelessness. I joined the European Parliament, as I told you, in July 2014, and shortly after the summer, when the parliamentary life began to unfold in its different branches and sets of interests, I realized that the oceans were one of the minor instances among the politicians, the financiers, and the lobbyists. The following year, and that's the slide I show, the following year in 2015, no, 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 uh, the previous slide, please. Uh, COP21 was held in Paris. I attended several events, and it was with disappointment that in the end, despite this progress made, I realized that the oceans were absent from the body of the Paris Agreement, as you can see in the table on the left, uh, to combat warm, uh, global warming. It was suddenly reduced to a distant echo. Uh, take note, in the introductory remarks, there is no reference in the treaties articles, which, in fact, are the treaty articles that make the law. In contrast, there were at least eight references to forests. And this shows the absence of ocean issues in politics, if we exclude aspects related to their appropriation and domination. Apart from that, the ocean is a cultural acquisition that manifests itself in carefree veneration. Next slide. I began, I began to understand and interpret this situation as a cultural and mystical anachronism when I came across the expression of ocean feeling, coined at the beginning of the 20th century by the French humanist and Nobel Prize winner for literature, Romain Rolland, to describe the feeling of unlimited unity and infinity. Next slide, please. This mystical, uh, this mystical feeling helped me to understand why marine sustainability was not imbibed in our cultural edifice and look, make me look for the origin on this meme. This concept and this concept of meme should not be taken in our from something. Uh, sorry, should be not take, um, from something other than the meetings we find in TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Meme is a neologism coined by the well-known biologist Richard Dawkins in 1976 in his first book, *The Selfish Gene*. A meme is an idea, behavior and cultural phenomenon that spreads and replicates in a society they are similar to genes um, and they evolve, evolve also. Memes spread and evolve through cultural transmissions. And like genes, memes are blocks of information. Let's let see the next uh, 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 slide. There is a cartoon that was published in New York in, uh, in 1983, in which one of five ladies in their tea time conviviality emphasizes with some candor uh, that she doesn't feel any concern or interest in the bottom of the ocean. I must say that I'm a deep sea biologist. Adding, I don't know why, but the fact is that I don't. And this is uh, this same distance is uh, uh, shown on the, on the, the faces of the other lands. And to understand, uh, and I think in fact this, these examples capture the meme of the popular perception of the ocean very effectively. It's the lack of concern in ocean issues. 
to understand the origin of this meme, we have to go back to the legal formulations concerning the use of the sea and of the ocean. And we need to go back to the Renaissance and certainly a little further back. Next slide. I will start with Hugo Gracius, a Jewish diplomat and philosopher who in um, 1609 published a small booklet that has influenced the law of the sea to this day. It is interesting to read, to read his arguments, his logic. He says, and I see it, if many ant on land or fish in a river, the forest will be without game and the river without fish, which is not so in the sea, by which the sea loses nothing. Grossius argues that the seas were vast, were inexhaustible, and not susceptible to possession or domination. The ideas of immunity and intangible generosity of the seas and oceans and their resources were the, were the first formulations with legal implications for a man that was centuries of earth culture. Uh, next slide. Let me go, go a little back. Next slide, please. Hey, ah, let me go. Let's say, in terms of legal perception of the ocean, uh, back, back, please. Okay, that one. Let me say that in terms of legal perception of the ocean, our popular culture has been very recently marked, until very recently, marked by the Renaissance, which reflect the ambitions that preceded it at the age of discoveries, which took place between the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 7th century, driven by uh, European powers. Confidence in navigation and the tangible rewards of first voyage fuel the myth, the myth of inexhaustibility. The oceans, which cover most of the planet, seem to be an infinite frontier of research and exploration. And this led to the idea that fishes were infinite and that human impact was negligible compared to the vastness of the seas. A widespread belief in the inexhaustibility and immunity of the oceans was then established. The chroniclers and the descriptions given by navigators, such that one of Fernand Magalhães' circumnavigations through its chronicler Antonio Pigafetta, was amazed that there was no monsters with flaming faces treating the chips and at the cessation of his book. Instead, flying fish were leaping off the water, and not just a few, but so many of them together that they looked like an island in the sea. Next slide. This inspired one of the most influential British political commentators of the early 18th century, Henry Schultz, to say concerning ocean resources that we now know that travelers do not exaggerate, acknowledging that the benevolent in intentions of a no, a no wise and group, group and a good providence of the ocean. The next slide, the meme of the impregnable ocean reached the 19th century and the 20th century unchanged. In a popular culture of cookery and gastronomy, Alexander Domas wrote in, the, in 1873 in Le Grand Dictionnaire de Cuisine, he wrote this. It has been calculated that if no accident prevented the hatching of eggs and each egg reached maturity, it would take only three years to fill the ocean so that you could walk across the Atlantic dry shod on the backs of the cod. Next slide. In 
in 1013, the influential British political commentator that, that I referred before, Henry Schultz, wrote that seas which surround us afford an inexhaustible mine of wealth. The mine we have to work upon is really inexhaustible. Next slide, please. And science helped with these conceptions. Sir Thomas Huxley, in 1883, at the opening of the World Fisheries Exhibition in London, stated that any attempt to regulate the fisheries on the seas seems, given the nature of the case, to be futile, given their full extent. Next slide. If this meme was born in our Western culture, the fact is that in the context of construction of globalization, it was fertilized, it has fertilized other ambitious cultures. It is interesting to see uh, the engraving illustration, il the engraving illustrating the event where two Chinese citizens sit on the front row of the World Expo. They learn. In the following centuries, a country that would become, this country would become the champion of illegal, unreported, and regulated fisheries. Next slide, please. Deep in the 20th century already, in uh, uh, 1957, two eminent Amer American scientists, Otto uh, Daniel and Francis Mino, the first, the, 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 the director of what became the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and the second, the, the director of the Museum of Natural History of New York, published a book that they entitled The Inexistable Sea. The book, I uh, must say, is a well-founded uh, thesis of knowledge about the, the oceans at the time. It is also a call for accelerated oceanographic research um, and it expresses a strong imaginative and enthusiastic belief in the opportunities for economic growth in ocean-related activities, imbued in an oceanic feeling of unity, limitness, and again, infinity, the authors concede that one day man will realize that in its generality, generosity, the sea is an It is a charming book, I must say, caught in the trap of inimmensurable Renaissance enthusiasm. Next slide. Um, uh, today, we realize that living marine research are finite. Science also show us that cumulative presses on the marine environment have clear negative impacts, jeopardizes ge uh, ocean resilience. Scientific evidence based on data has undoubtedly contributed to this progress. But the ocean, in the context of policies, has only recently made the required quantum leap. Please, next slide. Um, looking at the evolution of new treaties, international agendas, the emphasis on policies based on scientific knowledge has placed the ocean in an unprecedented position in global governance, but only in the last seven to eight years. I must say that the United Conventions of the, uh, the Law of the Sea contributed to this, is based on the accommodation of Renaissance ideals of Hugo Gross's Mar Libero, under national and international jurisdiction. Next slide. And John Seldon's Mar Le Clausel in national jurisdictions defined their aim. Uh, it was, next slide please, it was, uh, sorry, the, the previous one, sorry. It was a significant step, and close. And uh, it uh, was able to connect to fragmented laws created and convening during the last decades of the 20th century. Uh, but the fact is that when the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea was not no, uh, negotiated, it did not catch some of the ongoing 
Aiden travels in the ocean. Some ongoing process include limitations to fulfill the ability to remove uh, process or sequester CO2 from the atmosphere, the acidification, the loss of biodiversity, the genetic researches, the desoxygenation, the new, um, the, the new polluants like plastics, the impact of exotic species, the rising of temperatures, and the melting of polar ice. The convention did not clearly or comprehensively address the process of the time. As you now see, it took a few more years for the meme of cultural nonchalance based on the ocean feeling that had spanned for 400 years of history that the sea of the ocean is impregnable, inviolable, in, inexhaustible to enter into crisis. There is a precise date for this mutation. It is 2015. That year, that year, the ocean, sorry, I lost the image. Sorry. Okay. It was um, that it year. Okay? It is okay. That year, the ocean was placed in a precedent position in, in, in the, uh, international governance, and that's I want to demonstrate. For twenty-five years, the global development uh, goals program, which began in in the nineties with the OECD, its seven international development programs and continue with the United Nations uh, eight millennium development uh, programs in 2001 did not take the ocean into proper context. But in 2015, the, 2000, uh, in 2000, the, two, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development incorporated for the first time a stand-alone goal concerning ocean health, the SDG 14. And this is an, a hugely important step. Next uh, slide. Secondly, uh, 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 yeah, uh, but in um, secondly, the next one, sorry, this was on the same scope. Secondly, the, the ocean decade of ocean uh, science for sustainable development and the decade of ecosystem restoration were also set to be implemented between 2021 and 2030. The ocean we need, for the future we want is the message of the member states conveyed when they approve the decade of ocean science. Next slide. Sir, the decade is also the message of the starfish mission, uh, restore our ocean and waters by 2006, one of the five missions of Europe, which was given new importance to knowledge of the oceans within the European framework and also in the 20s, 20s, 20s. Next slide. Firstly, the United Nations regular global assessment process on the state of the marine environment, known as the World Ocean Assessment, whose first report appeared only in 2015. I must say the United Nations are, are slow, they were. They begin to talk about this in the twenties, uh, in the early two thousands, but only in twenty fifteen it appears the first. But the progress uh, was assumed by politicians and by the policies, and it is now the second one was published in two thousand twenty one, and. It is now already in the third assessment cycle. cycle. Next one. Fifthly, example, fifth example. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change published its first ever report on the ocean only in 2019. But it is now already in its sixth report in a few years. And the, the contribution to what is now the six reports reinforce the message that was finally consolidated in Glasgow on the COP26 after 
a semi failed blue COP25 in Chile that was organized in Madrid. While at COP26, the link between ocean and climate was finally clarified and accepted in the report, the IPCC emphasized and densifies the link between ocean, climate, biodiversity, ecosystems, highlighting another essential element, human societies. Next slide. In 2019, UNEP published the first global report on blue carbon. In two, the next slide, the United um, Nations Conference on, on the Oceans, the second one which really took place in Lisbon in, in 2022, uh, and the first one uh, two, uh, in 2017, and the next one will continue to be organized in France in 2025. And finally, and very important, the next slide. The new treaty on biodiversity beyond national jurisdictions was approved in 2023 after 21 years of negotiation. The fact is that according to science, the planet has entered a new geological uh, period, the Anthropocene, the data to, of the shift of, for the Holocene, the the planet's most uh, stable period to the Anthropocene is 2015. It is also the installation of the next slide, I'm, I believe, it's also the installation of the Mare Crisum, or the sea, the crisis of the sea, and the beginning of the progressive and expansive use of plastics. And for me, it took the site an uncomfortable sensation of floating marine plastics for society and politics to revise their sentiments towards the ocean and reflect it in global policies, as scientists and other privileged observers as have long demanded. The crease of the great ocean has finally awake popular culture and politics to a problem that has long be announced. Next slide. Plastics begin to be produced industrially into in the 30s and expanded uh, after the 50s. Uh, uh, sorry, it's the, 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 the previous one. Those of her, of us, that belong to the generation that first saw the mass consumption of plastics, wrapped goods, and in the invention of takeaway food in single-use plastics, celebrated and promoted the throwaway living in the, uh, the festival during 50 years without uh, concerning about it. And the combination of the, the ocean's pro pro progress very, very quickly. I must say, next slide, that... Uh, um, if we look at the literature, the Norwegian traveler Toyar de Tau recalled in an interview that he gave in 72. On Kontiki, for 100, 101 days, he saw no sign of man until he saw a shipwreck at the beach of one of the atolls of his destination. But in 69, traveling on another raft, the raft one barely Three days at sea, it seemed like it was a city sewer despite being more than 160 kilometers from land. It, that was the, uh, uh, probably a tanker that had uh, just passed by. And he continued during the voyage. On the right to uh, second, in, in the 70s, he decided to carry out a daily survey, de diving and taking samples of the oil clusters and he saw plastic container, nylon bags, empty bolts, all sorts of refuse in every day of the trip. In fact, this uh, crisis of the plastics that is significant for the, for the, for the ocean and call the attention of the society because the plastics, many of them floated and could be seen, 
Next slide. Uh, make uh, one of the markers of the entering of a new geological uh, geological period. This represents whole the end of the Holocene, whose date is uh, is is uh, consider the uh, nineteen fifty five and the rise of the new epoch the, during the, the Anthropocene. And the plastics one, are one of the markers of this change. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide. I must say that not all is, is bad. And uh, some politics are showing signs of hope. In, in recent uh, times, through large-scale programs, progress has been made on critical issues, just such as increasing the number and size of marine protected areas, improving the population trends of marine uh, species, uh, such as the cetaceans, some of them at, at, uh, were at the bridge of extinction, or bluefin tuna, reducing marine oil spills, Improving the quality of coastal waters in many regions. Uh, I lost again the image. I have to take attention that it's. Uh, the reduction of um, persistent organic, organic pollutants and uh, the things are not going too bad. The reduction of the percentage of globally threatened species list and IUCN. These are signs of hope. But the time to, to intervene is running out in the timeless ocean. And there you have the story. Of, and this all because we were, our culture was impregnated with this idea that the opaque ocean was infinite, inexhaustible, and we venerated it, but we didn't, it was so powerful that we need not care for it. And that has dominated the history of the relationship with man and the ocean. And let's hope that the mutation that occurred around 2015 was not too late. The man lasted too long and remain unchanged in politics for the first 75 years of the, the Anthropocene, this, as I told, was begun in the 1955. Uh, but uh, let's put the next slide, please. Uh, the, and, and the next one, please. Uh, but as a feminine note, I must say that I'm uh, turning more pessimist than optimist. The optimism is growing, but the pessimism is growing faster. If we look in particular to the wars and conflicts that have started again in recent years, the world continues to be a stage of territorial disputes and ideological and religious memes far removed from science where anti-science political leaders emerge occasionally. Scientists alone will not be able to bring about the necessary change. And turning scientific evidence into good governance is complex and often poorly managed. It will not succeed with scientists and politicians alone. The involvement of well-informed and competent citizens and young citizens is needed to move towards more inclusive, cooperative, scientific governance guided by the global concerns for the ocean and a generation performing in the ocean in, in the streets. And the last one, the manifestations of mistrust are not concealed and emerge in the most anticipated, in the most unanticipated scenarios. Uh, the leader 
of COP29 climate uh, discussions in uh, Dubai asserted very recently that there is no science to support that eliminating fossil, fu fossil fuels would maintain global temperatures below the globally recognized threshold of 1.5 degrees increase from in in industrial times. He also stated that discontinuing fossil, fu fossil fuels would enter sustainable progress unless you are prepared to regress the world back to living in caves. Such remarks were deemed extremely alarming and bordering, and, uh, bordering on climate de denial, contrasting sharply with the stance of United, Secretary, United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres. But please return to the previous slide. It's I want the message that I want to, to leave with you and the need of, in fact, um, engagement and participation uh, to, of the society, of the young people, to impose good governance and good politics uh, for the sake of the planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ricardo. It was a really uh, inspiring speech. I don't know if we have some questions, but I would like to just uh, start with a, a comment on uh, the, even if you want to, to give us some hope, the big picture is quite uh, frightening. And uh, maybe I have a, some feeling of um, like we are quite useless or at least not not heard so much in the political uh, spheres so yeah well let's hope we we will get some recommendation from you to to be more involved in the european policy or the national policies <clears throat> Do someone have some questions you can just switch on your camera and ask uh, questions or make some comments yeah Pola. <laughs> Hi, yeah, thank you very much, Ricardo. I think that was really interesting to see quite how long it's taken us to get a particular idea about the ocean in our heads and then quite how long it's taken us to get rid of it again and, and really listen to what's really going on. Um, but do you know if, if um, other realms have had a similar issue? You know, is, is this something that happened in on Earth, on terrestrial areas as well? Was there also this sort of perception of, you know, we've got a huge amount of space, we've got a huge amount of resources, or has that always been different because we're closer to it? I believe that the ocean is particularly uh, uh, the perception concerning the ocean.